praise you a little bit. I forgot that. Although we've been praying all morning. Thank you for something that's happening to me. And I think it's happening to everybody here. It is if we're willing. And I thank you that we feel the Holy Spirit beginning to move upon us. We thank you for it. We know it's the Spirit of Jesus. We thank you for the joy that's in our hearts, for the vision that we're getting, for the way our light <coughs> minds are suddenly becoming illumined as though the electric lights have been turned on in a dark night. And our hearts are full of flowing with love. We thank you for every bit of it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing for us. But I know that you didn't bring us up here to this glorious place just to give us a good spiritual tonic and a grand time. Lord, just bring us here to get us ready to save the world, to come to his rescue. And so this morning, here are my lips and here is my voice, and here I am. I would like to be erased if it were possible to let you come here and stand here in my place and tell the people who are so anxious to know how the Pentecost can fall upon America, how all the hearts in America can get a glow with a desire to be helpful to the world, how compassion can fall upon them. Speak now. We are all listening. What's thou desire to say to us? What does thou desire to ask of us? How can we do it? What can we do next? How can we keep ready? How can we keep fit? Like an athlete must keep fit for this great task. Now speak, we're listening. Amen. Several people have told me that we're mighty close to a Pentecost. And some of them have gone off the uh, end and have had it. I hope so, for that's the hope of the world. Pentecost or perish, I believe, is a pretty good truth right now. And so I want to talk to you this morning a while about what happened at the first Pentecost. If we're to have one, is there anything we can do about it? Or will it just happen in spite of us? No. Will it happen because of us? Well, perhaps we have something to do with it. So I want, first of all, to discuss what preceded it. Jesus Christ had risen. He had talked to them many, many times. Once there were 500 together, as many as we are in this whole camp. And he talked to them. Matthew tells what he said to them. He said, Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all I've commanded. Mark tells what he said to them. He said, Go into all the world and preach the good news to the whole creation. Luke tells what he said to them. He said, Go and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins to all the nations. Acts tells what he said to them. You shall be my witnesses to the end of the world. And every one of them said, he said world. He didn't say the United States of America. And then, one day, he vanished. The clouds were low, I guess, or at least a cloud came down, and he went in it and was gone. But before he went, he said, you stay here in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit falls upon you. And so it says that they were together, 120 of them were mentioned at one time, so there were probably that many most of the time. They were in a room, perhaps the very one where he had his last supper, owned likely by the mother of Mark, the writer of Mark. They were in that room, and some of the time they'd go to the temple, and all the time they were praying. They were in prayer constantly.
constantly. And another thing about them was that they were, if they talked at all, they were remembering Jesus Christ. They were remembering how lovely he was. They were remembering that every minute of the time he was looking from right to left to help somebody, that the words that flowed from his mouth were the most beautifully loving, tender, compassionate words the world had ever heard. There's never anything like that in all history. They were remembering that, and they were remembering those of them who had seen it. John was one of them, remembered how he died how as they stretched him on the cross, before the first hammer blow came, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. How even hanging there in awful agony, he looked down and see his mother and remembered her and told John to take care of her. How even in his agony, he'd said to the thief beside him on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. They remembered all of that. And then they were so ashamed of themselves. Before that awful agony, two of them, James and John, got their mother to ask him this closest to him in his kingdom while the others would be out further. And the rest were mad at them. And there were there was petty jealousy, but that had all been wiped away now. And they, in humility and love, they loved one another. And then the other thing that had happened to them during those ten days that I'm talking about now, I almost wish this camp would last ten days. I'll bet you will wish that Saturday morning. I had wished it already. And those ten days they were spending expecting something. Because he had said, wait until the Holy Spirit falls upon you. Then go out and capture the world for Christ. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they were expecting. Now notice what it was. Remembering Christ, loving one another, praying all the time, expecting something. And then it came. They didn't know what was coming, but it came. Believe me, it was marvelous. It was God loves to astonish us. You can expect to be astonished at what will happen to you if it comes as it came then. To us, perhaps, in this room. Well, what was it that happened? Suddenly, while they were together, praying, feeling good like we do now, suddenly there was something like a mighty wind and then, suddenly again, tongues like flame were playing on the heads of everybody. There were 120 of them, or maybe more. And they were playing on their heads like that, but suddenly the flames vanished. They had gone inside. How do you know? Because that flame was the visible presence of the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and it went inside just like the Holy Spirit has spoken to Mary and to when the Holy Spirit came down like a dove upon Christ, the Holy Spirit came down like a flame and went inside of them and they began to be like Christ. Just like him. Now the first thing that astonished everybody was this. The people came in, I, don't, I suppose this wind brought them in, I don't know what, or else they heard a tremendous talking there and 3,000 people came in from all over Jerusalem. It was at the time when there were an awful lot of people in Jerusalem. They were there for the festival, and they were waiting. They hadn't gone home yet, and they rushed in to see what was happening, and this is what happened to them. To their great amazement, everybody there grabbed one of them and began to talk to him with zeal and irresistible enthusiasm about Christ is risen. He's just given us his Holy Spirit. We're all full of it. What amazed a lot of them was that they could talk to them in their own tongues. And they said, as you remember in this story, i read a little of that here. They were all amazed and wondered and said, 
These people are all Galileans are talking to us, but how in the world do we hear them in our own native languages? Here we are, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia, and Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and the parts of Libya, and beyond Cyrene, and the visitors from Rome, and Jews, and proselytes, and Cretans, and Arabians. Why do we hear them in our own language? That astonished them, and it really was wonderful. That's a miracle, of course. You can't explain it. You can't explain any miracle. It wouldn't be a miracle anymore if we explained it. But there was another miracle, and that was that they had so much inside they just couldn't keep it to themselves. They had to tell it to somebody else. They began then and there to fulfill what Jesus had told them, go and capture the world for the greatest good news the world has ever known. Capture it. And those 120 set out to capture the world, and they captured 3,000 that day. It says that before that day was over, 3,000 of them had been baptized. Some of them, when they saw the way these people behaved, which wasn't very orderly, said they're drunk. They've had too much new wine. And then Peter got up to explain it. And this is what he said. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. That's nine o'clock in the morning, about like it is now. But this is what the prophet Joel prom promised. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Yes, and your men servants and maid servants in those days. On them I will pour out my spirit and they'll prophesy. Then said Peter to them, Men of Israel, this 3,000 here, hear my words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God by the mighty works and miracles that he did. As you yourself have seen, that Jesus was delivered up by the definite plan of foreknowledge of God and was crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up. He was loosed from the pangs of death. It wasn't possible for death to hold him. And being exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father what it was promised, the Holy Spirit, he has poured this out on you that you now see and hear. Let all the house of Israel therefore know that God has made him both Lord and God, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then when they heard Peter saying this, they said, and this is what the Bible says, Brethren, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, and you shall receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. And they did, 3,000 of them. And that's the way the church started. There were a great many other things that happened to them, too. Love. There was so much love among them that it says that in that early church, Nobody was in want. It was a very poor city, and the poorest people in the city followed came into the church, but they were in any trouble. Why? Why, because there was everybody helping everybody else. The people who had shared were those who had not. Some people say, don't read that in the, in the, in the church anymore, because that's communism, and communism is wicked. But I want you to notice the difference between that the communism in Russia and China is not out of a great generous heart, not out of the Holy Spirit, forced on people. Those who had it, had it all taken away from them. And if they resisted, they were killed. But the communism that they had in the early church, which sometimes the Russians claim they had, that communism was not forced on anybody. It came from the inside. It was love helping everybody else. Now, that early church went out to capture the world. They had received the Holy Spirit, and what was the proof of it? 
The proof of it was that it was too good to keep. They couldn't keep it to themselves. I got a parable over in India. I'm afraid half of you have heard me tell it because it's one of my favorites. Jesus didn't tell it, but he might have. It's just like him. Once upon a time, this fable in India says, there was a man in hell. And, God, and this man prayed, God, please help me out of hell, until God decided he would. And he let down a big, long carrot. The leaves of the carrot kept coming down and down until they reached the level of hell. And the man grabbed the leaves, and the carrot began to go back to hell, heaven, slowly. But when it got up six feet above hell, the flames of hell, this man's two legs were dangling there, and one man grabbed each leg. And when it got up 12 feet above hell, there were four legs now. Each of those two men had oh, two legs, and each man grabbed one of those legs. Then they went up 18 feet, and this time there were eight legs. And when they got 24 feet, there were 16 legs, and each man grabbed one. And as they went up, there were 16, 32, 64, 128, that's size I can count. And this man, when he looked down there at those, that pyramid of legs, people hanging on below him, and looked up at these carrot leaves, he said, these leaves will never carry all these people. So he gave a very vigorous kick, and the leaves broke. And he went back to hell with all the rest. And the moral of it is, you can't get to heaven unless you want to take all hell with you. <laughs> if you go back and you read in this book, where it's easy enough to understand, in the book of Peter, you'll find that Jesus himself went down into hell after he was crucified and rose. While he was, perhaps while he was lying in the grave, his soul went down to hell and preached to the people in hell. Did you ever know that? And so when they got this Holy Spirit, they were as anxious to save the whole world as he was. The difference between you and Jesus and between me and Jesus is this. Our human nature wants to pray for ourselves all the time. Prayer is like the world to us. It's a gimme a proper a proposition. We sanctified selfishness. It's just as selfish as unsanctified selfishness. Selfishness in prayer. There, George Eliot has, in that wonderful poem that I love called The Choir Invisible, a line in scorn of miserable little aims that end in self. And you might change that to in scorn of miserable little prayers that end in self. When you get the Holy Spirit, your prayer doesn't end in trying to save your soul. It ends in trying to save the world. That's then you get like Jesus, and he didn't die on the cross to save his soul. He died on the cross to save the world. And so, one of the proofs that the Holy Spirit fell on that crowd that day was that they started out to capture the whole human race. They didn't give it up either. They went on and on and on. They began to be persecuted. Paul tried to destroy the church. And you remember how he got caught by the Holy Spirit. He just couldn't take it. I think the thing that started Saul, Paul, being converted was to see the way Stephen died. As he died, he said, I see Christ sitting at the right hand of God. And then he was convicted. So it went on and on and on. I want to read what happened to these Christians a little bit again out of this book. They were tortured as perhaps no people ever were. The Jews were killed by the Germans, by Hitler, an awful lot of them. But these Christians took it worse than the Jews ever did. Listen to what happened to them. Many were tortured, refusing to deny Christ. They had faith that when they died, they would rise to a better life. Many were stoned. Some were sawed in two. They
they were killed with a sword. They went around wearing skins of sheep and goats. They lost all they possessed. They were in hunger and pain and ill-treated. They wandered over deserts and mountains and lived in holes and caves of the earth. They didn't have to, but they were out to capture the world and take the consequences. They never shot anybody, but they were willing to be killed. This world was not worthy of such men. And all of them won heaven's praise for their faith. Here on earth they did not receive what God had promised. He, through Christ, had, had planned something better for us. But the work of these men, which these men began, was not complete without us. Then I want to read a little bit of what happened to Paul. As the whole book of Acts, or two-thirds of it's about Paul. Because Luke was along with Paul so much of the time and got his story. And this is what happened to him the most famous of all these terrific missionaries. He tells it himself in this book of the, in the, in Car, uh, the letter to the Corinthians. He said, I have been beaten so many times that I can't count them. I have often been nearly dead. Five times the Jews gave me 39 strokes with a whip. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was in shipwrecks. I spent a night and a day in the sea. I've taken many journeys. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in cities, in deserts, and on the sea. I've been in danger from false brothers. I've gone through hard labor and great suffering. I've had many nights with no sleep. I've been through hunger and thirst, often with no food at all. I've been cold and without clothes. In addition to all these things, I've had the work and the worry of the churches on my mind every day. If anyone is weak, I am weak with him. When anyone leads another into sin, I burn with anger about it. Now, that was Paul. That, that was only about the middle of his life when he wrote that. But in the end, if maybe tomorrow night, I'll tell about Paul in prison. I was down there a couple of years ago, and been a long time in the hole where he spent his last days. That's the way the Christians were, undefeatable, uncom uncomfortable. But they didn't have a sword, they didn't have a gun, they didn't have a missile in their hands, they had love. They had compassion. They had this message. And they went on and on and on and on until they conquered the Roman Empire with an enormous assault of compassion and in love. The emperor himself capitulated, finally. The biggest empire the world had ever known fell before these un undauntless soldiers of Christ because they had the Holy Spirit, and that's the proof they had it. And if you get the Holy Spirit, you'll be like that. The people who get it can't keep it. It bursts out. It's an explosion. And they won the world. Then... Constantine, the emperor, became Christian. Or at least he became partly Christian. When an emperor becomes a Christian, you want to watch him because he's likely to change it, and he did. It became a, a illegal, a criminal offense not to be a Christian after the Roman emperors became Christian. Everybody had to be. No asking, no questions. They, he sent his soldiers through the Tiber River and baptized them all. They were exactly as good when they got on the other side as when they went in the river. <laughs> and that's when the church began to deteriorate. When everybody was in it, there was no more evangelism. Here's something interesting. Before the days of Constantine, you can't find a single church surviving. No cathedrals, no Christian temples. The catacombs and deserts and little homes were their churches. They were spending their money and their effort winning the world, capturing it, with just as much zeal as the communists are trying to capture it now. They were out to capture the world until Constantine made it illegal not to be a Christian. You're, a, you're either a Christian or you're a criminal, and you deserve death at that period. And then see what happened. 
they began to pour all their efforts into building cathedrals. All the cathedrals came from that time on. No effort to evangelize, excepting a few uh, strange souls like St. Francis, amazing people, but the great majority of, of the people of all the money was devoted to spill, building St. Peter's and the cathedrals all over Europe. Then what happened to the church? When it lost its spirit, and it became rich, down from the north of Europe began to come the barbarians. They poured down on them the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. You've read about all that. And the Vandals, and they nearly overwhelmed Rome. Then up from the south, out of Arabia, of course, they captured all Africa. Africa had been the garden of the Roman Empire. It was far wider, tremendous fields, beautiful fields. But the, the Islam, the, the uh, not the communists of that day, but the Mohammedans of that day, swept across northern Africa, took it all, swept up through Spain and captured it all and kept it 700 years. And they would have destroyed all the Christian churches of the day if the Battle of Tours had not gone against them in France. Almost overwhelmed from the north, almost overwhelmed from the south, because they lost the Holy Spirit and they were spending their efforts on building temples instead of saving souls. That new thing that had gone out to capture the world had been ruined by wealth. And of course, you can begin to realize why I'm saying that, because it happened again, and it's happening in America now. Listen to the church. This, uh, it had already begun to work when Revelation was written in one church. Laodicea was in an unusually prosperous, fertile area. And this is what happened to that church. I know your work. You're neither hot nor cold. I would that you were cold or hot. And so because you're lukewarm and either cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not knowing that you're wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Fire the Holy Spirit. That you may be rich in white garments to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen. And to solve the ointment in your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and chasten. So be zealous and repent. That's what happened. And if it hadn't been for the Reformation, the church that was no longer filled with the Holy Spirit would have perished. Martin Luther and the Reformers. And then came along in the Roman Catholic Church the Counter-Reformation. And if it hadn't, the Catholic Church would have gone and there would have been nothing but Protestantism. And then these Protestants fired by Luther and John Wesley and a long list of them began to come across here to the United States. And here we built up, we had a cause, we were going to build up a, a, a new world, a new nation dedicated to God. And we worked at it until we got it accomplished. Then we got rich. And then instead of going out to capture the world, with the tremendous zeal that they had a few decades ago, we began to build cathedrals, temples. The big noise around the United States today is big church buildings. There's going to be one billion dollars invested in building churches this year in the United States. How much is going to be invested in saving that world out there that is going to hell? Three cents out of a dollar. When you put a dollar into your church collection, three cents goes abroad to save the world, and 97 cents stays here, and 80 cents stays in your own local church to build a church to keep it going. That's the way it is. That's a fact. These are not theories. These are facts. You can corroborate what I just told you by writing to your own mission board. And we're just like the church was in the Middle Ages when it was threatened 
from the south by the Islam and threatened from the north by the Vandals and the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the Barbarians. Now, that's why we need a Pentecost. The same thing that happened in the days of Martin Luther and John Wesley got to come again and it's got to be bigger than it was then. It's got to be a world Pentecost, a Pentecost this time that doesn't reach across Europe or across America, but breaks out of America. It's got to be a new explosion of the Holy Spirit. And then we'll begin to put our money and our lives and our efforts just because we're so full of it, we can't hold it so glowing with this glad good news, you can't stop telling it all over the world. I'll tell you why the communists are winning. Because they're out to capture the world with all their might. They've got a gospel. It's a gospel without God. They think they've found a way to make a better world. They know it's bad. They've seen the evil and they're trying to do it their way. It's a terrible way, but they think you've got to be rough. Well, we do in war, too. Whenever we have a war, we think you can't be gentle. There are no rules. You kill a man any way you can, and you kill him before he kills you. The communists think this is a war, and they're in it now, and you can't be gentle in a war. So they're out to capture the world, to get rid of what they think is the reason why the world is better. They think it's because the rich are exploiting the poor. And there's so much truth in that, that it makes it sound reasonable to the poor. Let me illustrate what I mean by that being true. I'm not a very much afraid of being called a communist. I've never heard that I've been called a communist but once. That's because I got a letter from Eisenhower. He's a communist, you know. <laughs> well, uh, but I'm not afraid of this, but I'll tell you what, uh, what, what, uh, why communism takes so well in Asia and Africa and Latin America among the hungry, landless, illiterate people. Because a landlord who owns their land, go to Egypt, for example. Egypt is owned by a few hundred people. They own the whole thing. And all the rest of the people are wretched, they're poor. Do these people live there? No, they live up in Paris or in some other place. Absentee landlords. But they make the people pay, give half their crop to the landlord for the privilege of working on that land. Half of it. And the other half doesn't last them more than seven or eight months. Then they go to a money lender. Now this isn't in Egypt only. This is all over this part of the world where there are two classes, the rich and the poor. The rich owning the land, the educated ones, and the poor having nothing. They go to the money lender and they borrow, they don't know how much interest they pay, they can't count. Trust him or they don't trust him. They know he's crooked, but they have to take it. Then they take that money and they go back and buy from the landlord what he took from them so it'll last the other six or seven months. And these men here from India know I'm telling you the truth. And then no wonder they hate the landlord and no wonder they hate the, the money lender. They hate them bitterly. And so the communists come along and say, those fellows are your enemies. That's why you're down. They don't want you educated. If they did, they'd educate you. They want you to be ignorant so that they can rob you. That's what's happening around the world. That's, and if we Americans haven't found that out yet, whom do we hobnob with when they're over there? The government, the money lender, the rich, the landlords, whom do the communists hobnob with? They go down underneath and tell these illiterate people, you've got to have a revolution. You've got to overthrow them like we did in Russia and like we did in China. See, they're out to capture the world, and we haven't been. But the moment the Holy Spirit falls in my country, and they get tender-hearted like you are, and they want to go out like you do, and help the world just because it's in tragic need to help those hungry, illiterate people. We've got everything. All the advantages on our side, including God. For after all, communism is a godless religion without God. We've got him on our side if we help him. And he's against us, and the world's against us until we do. And right now we're under the condemnation of God because we haven't helped the world. That's what's the matter. As soon as we get this Pentecost, the Holy Spirit doing to us what the Holy Spirit did to them, 
So the real one to go out and capture the world is going to be easy. I tell you what's the matter with us. We're standing here with our backs to the wall trying to preserve that nice world. It's been such a lovely world for investment, for enterprise, for exploitation. We don't want to disturb it. We've been getting $2 out of it every time they just send a dollar back. Some people keep, come, keep coming to me and saying, look how generous we are. Of course we are. But for every dollar of generosity we give abroad, we get $100 from there. Everyone, that's the thing. That isn't very generous. But as soon as we get the compassion of Jesus in our hearts, we no longer look upon this world as a, an opportunity for exploitation. We no longer want to retain the status quo, leave it the way it is now. We'll go out there with a great assault of compassionate love, and we'll tell them for the, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're out here to help you out of your ignorance, out of your hunger, to make long life. What we need now is an assault of compassion, and it won't come unless we get the Holy Spirit. It's got to fall on us. I've noticed the people across America who've got it, are doing it. These Wycliffe translators going out to the edge of the earth and sacrificing themselves and others, but nobody else does that, excepting those who have the Holy Spirit. So, I don't believe the salvation of the world is going to begin in Washington, not unless by some miracle they get it. I believe it's going to happen in places like this, uh, this uh, CFO camp. Now, God is love, and when the Holy Spirit gets in it, it's love that got in it. Not uh, Eros, the Greeks had three names for love, Eros, which is the love that Cleopatra and Sappho had, not that, but Agape, the love that Jesus had, who every minute of his day had one endless passion, and that was to help people to win people, to save people. When that gets in us, that's the Holy Spirit. And then we can't help helping people. Pentecost are never twice the same. This one, if we get it, won't be the same as the first one. The Pentecost that they had at Hernhut, which sent them out in, from Germany in that tremendous campaign to save the world. That wasn't like the first one. And the Pentecost they had when John Wesley was here wasn't like the first one. God likes variety. And I don't know what this will be like, but I do know what you'll be like and I'll be like with the burning in our hearts with the yearning to share the gladdest, most marvelous thing the world has ever known. The only hope of the world with everybody else. They won't be satisfied until every man, woman, and child in the world comes to take it down. I forget whether I talked about that the other day. I think I did, but I repeat it, I guess. If I said it, I repeat it. That the Christ is on the cross, yes, is often said. It isn't true. Not unless he's on the cross in us. Unless the same yearning, willingness to give up ourselves, that he was in him when he died on the cross, is in us, then that isn't true. But if he comes and dwells in us when the Holy Spirit comes in us, that's the Spirit of Christ coming in us. And when he comes and uses our hands and our tongues and our minds and our hearts and our feet and our purses and everything we are, everything we have to help the world, then that's Christ still at work saving the world through us. So, thank God for this wonderful camp. I think it isn't ended yet. The most wonderful camp I was ever in was down at Canuga, when actually we had a tremendous experience of the Holy Spirit. But this was maybe more tremendous before Agnes Sanford gets through. Isn't it wonderful? It's too wonderful to keep. But can you go home and do? Tell everybody. Tell everybody, not about CFO. Tell everybody about the hope of the world. If you want material information, literature about it, I'll be glad to send you what we have, but write it. There isn't very much about 
the Pentecost of all explode with compassion to the men of the world. Write it. All right. If you can't write now, learn how. Start. If you can't get into the Saturday Evening Post or the Reader's Digest, get into your local newspaper. We'll send you material. If any of you have money and you want to invest it in writing, there's a whole lot of things we'd like to print for America. I don't think that the big problem of the world today is the world. I think the big problem in the world today is America. I think the problem is that there aren't enough of us who feel like you do. And now we've got to depend upon the Holy Spirit burning in our hearts while we go out and each one win one a day and keep on and on and on until like geometrical progression. We capture the world like the poor early church captured the Roman Empire. Then when we have that kind of an assault, you know what happened to the communists? Why, their program will be picky and they'll dry up and blow away because they've got nothing to offer compared to what we have. Why, there's an article printed, I wish I had it here, by a newspaper in Paris, a communist newspaper. This man, writing to Christian, says, you've got a better way of making the world right than we have, a better gospel than we have, but you don't practice it, you don't believe it. While we sacrifice everything for our communism, we give up our money, we give up our lives, we're willing to die for it. And although yours is better than ours, we win because we backed it with our lives. That's the difference. Our religion is the highest, most wonderful thing the world ever saw, but it turned out to be too high for us when we could find a cheap substitute. And so we found another way to be Christian besides the way the early church was that went out and gave his life. And that other way hasn't worked. And now it's likely to destroy it. So we're going to find, get back to reality and back to the real urge method of the early church. We're going to have a Pentecost across America. Pray for it. Believe in it. i got to stop now. But this is what I'm going to plead for. Pray, pray, pray all the time. Not about yourself at all. You can forget yourself now. Uh, yeah, that's finished. If, you're, if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, that's finished. He'll take care of you. But your world isn't finished because the Holy Spirit isn't in it. Pray for everything that God wants you to pray for. Where, share his needs with him, his care. And then believe, according to your faith, it'll happen to you. I believe. I believe that we're not going to perdition. I believe that my nation is on the way to a great spirit awakening. I believe that 1961 is the changing date in history. I believe that we're going to intervene and change the very course of history because we're letting Christ do it. I believe that this old world is going to be lifted out of its present dis uh, despair and its present hate. I believe that armaments are going to be wiped off the face of the earth. I believe that armies will be abolished and there will be nothing left but, sold, but policemen. And I believe that then the brotherhood of man will come. And I believe the communists will all be converted to Jesus Christ because they've seen the right way to do it. I believe. Do you believe it with me? Faith it shall be done. I tell you, in this room here is the greatest power in the, in the world today if we believe strong enough and our belief gets into our words, our feet, our hands, our actions, and we bet our lives on it. Ed, uh, Studdard Kennedy was the most terrible poet of the first war, marvelous man, with a heart that overflowed like Christ. And he wrote one poem I wish I could quote, but enough to quote a little of it. He said, you ask me to prove that Christ will win. You fool, I can't, but I can bet my life on it. And I do. That's where we are. The future will prove it. Oh yes, that poem said, no man can prove the future. But we can bet our life on it. We make the future. That's precious. Oh Christ, we thank thee that thou art alive. 
and that every once in a while we feel the we feel it here in this camp and we are thankful. We know that thy Holy Spirit, thy loving Spirit, has got into our hearts because we love. We love one another. Now we love our world. We don't love it because it's lovable, but because it's pitiable. We love it because it's tragic, it's in danger. It's like a drowning man. We don't ask that drowning man if he's a communist before we pull him out. All we ask is that thou wilt help us pull him out. God help us to go out and infect all California now with a blessed infection. Help us to go out and set the souls of the people of California on fire with a fire that's burning in our own souls. That stop being concerned about our own salvation. That's finished. No use worrying about it anymore. And becomes concerned with the salvation of mankind that hasn't begun the will begin when America glows like these electric lights do when we press the button and suddenly the whole room becomes a light. God help us to go out and press buttons until the whole of America is a bright shining light until the light reaches around the world. The light of love and action. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we rededicate ourselves to that. That's all we can do and all that thou dost ask and all we need to do and thou wilt do the rest. Lord, use me, use even me, just as thou wilt and when and where. Amen.